Hallelujah. You know, uh, last week we were talking about Psalm 100, and uh, this week we're back in James, back in the fourth chapter of James, and, and I just wanted to share some things with you from that that area, uh, that area of Scripture. Uh, we're going to start in James chapter 3. I know that we've kind of touched on this in the past, but we're going to look at it again and, and look at it from a different angle. It says, when you pray for things, you don't get them because you want them for the wrong reasons, for your own pleasures. When we pray for things very often, and we pray for things that we want just for our own pleasures. And, and it can be any kind of thing. See, it can be, we can be praying for just pretty much anything. It doesn't have to be for stuff. You know, sometimes we, we want people to act certain ways. We want things to, circumstances to change around us. We, even in our nation, we want our nation to be different. But we want it all for our own personal reasons because it'll make it easier on us. You know, I, uh, I want to say something, and I've probably become very unpopular just for a moment here. Do you ever stop and, and say, because the Word of God says, let me, let me pre, 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 preface this, the Word of God says that no one rises in power unless God puts them there. Do you ever stop and say, God, why did you want um, or Biden to be in power? And, you, and I know some of you are going, oh, he doesn't want that. That's, he is there. And, and, I, and I'll preface what I'm about to say with this too. If, it's God, if God did not want him to be in power at this time, who could withstand God? Who can withstand God? If it was not God saying, I want this for this moment, who could withstand him and put him in power without God? Any of you stronger than God? How about the Democratic Party, the Republican Party? How about Russia, China? Anybody? No one. So let's just stop for a moment and say, did any, has any of us ever said, God, why is it that the people who are in power, whether it's Obama or, or uh, whether it is Trump or whether it's, I mean, it's Biden or Obama or Trump or whoever, did anybody ever stop and say, God, why did you lift this person up to this place of authority. And I believe that sometimes God puts us in oppressive situations, in places where we don't feel comfortable because He is wanting us to turn our attention away from man onto Him and to seek His face and to repent of our sins and to then begin to serve the Lord. You know, we, we look at the, the great heroes of the Old Testament. I, I, and I'm going to say this too. I didn't plan on saying any of this this morning. We look at the great heroes, heroes of the Old Testament like Joseph and Daniel, Jeremiah, um, people who, who stood firm on the Word of God, people who didn't give in, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. And we recognize that these people did so not when everything was going well, but when everything was going against them. That they stood out as, as great people of faith because they stood on the Word of God when everything was going wrong. And that's why we honor them as people of faith today. All of the apostles preached the Gospel. They went out and they built church organizations. Not, not buildings so much, but church groups built them throughout the, the known world at that time. Under the, the oppression of of the Romans and under the oppression of the Sanhedrin. Their very lives, all of them pretty much, were killed violently because of their faith. So when we think that everything has to be going our way if, in order for us to be in the will of God, we're only fooling ourselves and we're disregarding what the Bible teaches. So anyway, it says, when you pray for things, you don't get them because you're looking for things for your own desires. You want them for the wrong reasons, your own pleasures. Sometimes we just pray about nations. We pray about personal things. We ask God to give us stuff. And it's just for our pleasures. It's for our pleasures. Rather than saying, God, what is it that you want from us? Do you want us to be doing something differently? Do you want us to be looking at things in a different way? Do you want us to be changing the way that we live? He says, you are unfaithful people in verse 4. Don't you know that the love of this world is hatred toward God? 
And whoever wants to be a friend of this world is an enemy of God. See, when we want the things of this world, John tells us in 1 John chapter, uh, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15, don't love the world and what it offers. Those who love the world don't have the Father's love in them. And he goes on and says, for the things of this world, the lust of the eyes, those things that we see and we want, the lust of the, uh, lust of the, of the flesh, those things that feel good and, and we desire, and the pride of life, what makes us feel important. He says, those aren't of oh God, those are of the world. So we're told, un unfaithful people, don't you know that to love the world is, is, is to be an enemy of God? Do you want to be an enemy of God? Do you want to be on the side that says, I, I'm God, I'm, I'm withstanding you, I'm, I'm withstanding your word. I don't want to be on your side, I just want what I want. You know, I, every once in a while I hear a song on a commercial that says, I want it that way, you know. And, I, and I'm thinking, you know, that's pretty much the song of our society. I want it my way. I want it my way. Because I think my way is the best way. Without stopping to say, God, what is your way? Do you want me to go through the fire in order to proclaim you as Lord? Do you want me to face the lions in order to exalt your name? Do you want me to go into a slavery condition, to be imprisoned so that I can show that you work even in those areas? Do you want me to be thrown into a pit while I'm proclaiming the, the rightness of God and his word? As, you, as these men of the Old Testament. What is your way, Lord God? Do you want me to have to stand up against the powers that be so that I can continue to, to proclaim that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords? What is your way, Lord God? You know, in, uh, I was thinking about an Old Testament passage. It's found in 1 Kings and the 17th chapter, and it's about a man named Elijah. When you look at Elijah, here's another one of those men who were, who were just the, the heroes of the Old Testament. Elijah. All of us know the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel. But pre pre previous to that, Elijah was one of just a few men who were holding on to the Word of God, to the laws of God, in a, in a society that was being run by corrupt kings and corrupt, a corrupt government where they were promoting the, the worship of Baal and, and uh, uh, Molech and other, other foreign gods. They were promoting these things and they were sacrificing children to their false gods. And, and Elijah was one of those who withstood the, the government. And, and he, they didn't withstand the government to the point where they were saying, we're going to rise up and, and take over. What they did is they went to the leadership of their nation and they proclaimed, this is what God is saying to you. So under hardship and under, under duress, uh, Elijah goes to Ahab. You know, we all heard of Ahab and Jezebel. He goes to Ahab, and he says to Ahab, you know, I am uh, I'm here to tell you that uh, there, it's not going to rain until I say so. And, you know, and you go, how can a man say that? How can, how can anybody say that? Elijah could say that simply because he had been walking with God, and, he, and God had been speaking to him, and he had been obedient to God's words up to this point. And so let's read. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1, it says, Elijah, who was from uh, Tishbe, he was a Tishbite, but had settled in Gilead, said to Ahab, I solemnly swear as the Lord God of Israel whom I serve lives, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years unless I say so. How could he say that? He could say it only because he had been walking with the Lord. You know, in the, in the Old Testament, when a prophet spoke, it came about because he spoke it because God told him to speak it. Not because he just felt that way. Elijah didn't go to Ahab and say, see, I'm going to show you how much power I have. It's not going to rain. God had already spoken this to him, and he says, until I say so, it's not going to rain here. He says, then again, the Lord spoke to, him, to Elijah, and he says, I want you to leave here, go to the east, and hide by... The, the Cherubith River, 
which is east of the Jordan River, and you can drink from the stream that I've commanded, and I've commanded ravens to feed you there. So Elijah left and did what the word of the Lord had told him. He went to live by the Cherith River, which is east of Jordan, and the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and in the evening, and he drank from the stream. When we walk with the Lord, the Lord takes care of our needs. When you are totally trusting in God, and you're not just wanting the things of this world, the Lord takes care of you. The Lord will meet your needs. He did this, and you go, well, you know, I, you know, having birds bring in meat and bread, free, uh, that doesn't sound very appetizing to me. Listen, when it was not raining in, this, in that land for three and a half years, things were getting pretty, pretty, uh, shy. It was hard to find meat and bread. And these ravens were bringing this in by the, by the, the hand of God and, and feeding him. And sometimes when we're doing things and we know that we're in the will of God, everything's starting to work out. And we go, oh wow, you know, people around us are all starving. You know, that king's being shown that he can't treat us this way because God has said no, no rain. And he'll, soon he'll learn his lesson because that king's going to get hungry too. And we think things are really going to go well for us. And they are going well for us. But they don't always stay that way. If we read on to, in verse 7, it says, But after some time, the stream dried up. And because there was no rain in the land. Sometimes when you're doing the Lord's will, the stream dries up. You know, God takes care of you, God takes care of you, and then all of a sudden... Wow, what's happening? I, I, God, I, I thought you told me you were going to feed me here and I could drink from this stream and the birds were going to bring me food and I was going to just kind of live a life of ease while you know, you're know you teaching Ahab and, and the, the uh, heathens out there a lesson. And now, what are you doing? What did I do wrong? Why are things going wrong? Do you ever get like that? you ever get to where you, you think you're doing what God has asked you to do and then all of a sudden things fall apart? Going back again to the New Testament where all of the apostles going out, doing the Lord's work. Jesus said, I am sending you out as, as sheep among wolves. I, I'm telling you to go into every nation and preach the gospel. And make disciples and, and uh, you know, teach them to do the things that I've taught you to do. And they were doing well. And you know, They went out on the day of, of, uh, at Pentecost and Peter and the disciples, that 120 that were in the upper room, were speaking of the great things of God in the streets of Jerusalem. And 3,000 souls become part of the body of Christ on that one day. Things are going really well. And then as they, they every day they would meet together, and it says they would break bread together, and they would just share the, the goodness and, and the love of God. And people who had lots of stuff would begin selling their things and giving it, uh, and, you know, sharing it with those who didn't have anything. Everything was going well. And then the king got a hold of James, the brother of John, and had him killed. And when he saw that that made the people happy, made the, the Jewish leaders happy, he grabbed a hold of Peter. And he was going to have him killed as well. All of a sudden, all of this great work that was being done and the thousands of people that were coming into the kingdom of God because they were repenting of their sin, we're living in fear because the king rose up against them. And their leader, James at that time was the head of the council, was taken and, and murdered by King Herod. And then Peter, the, the one who was predominantly the spokesperson for all of the apostles, again taken and they were going to kill him and had it not been for a miracle where God where the people of God started praying and seeking God and asking God for this, this miracle of release for Peter. And God sent an angel to set him free, loose the bombs that were on him, open the gates of the prison, and Peter was able to walk out. A miracle took place. See, in the midst of the, of the hardship, in the midst of the trial, when people turn to God, God does things. He does miracles. When we, are, when we are thinking that we can handle this, you know, 
It's okay, we're going to work it out. We'll just get the right person in office. Or, or we'll work it out. We'll just find the right solution. We'll get the right vaccine. We'll get the right pills. We'll, we'll, we'll get the right kind of job. I, I, you know, everything's going to work out. We'll, we'll show those heathens out there that they can't tear down Christians. When things seem like they're all going to work out, we find that they don't. These Christians in Jerusalem had it all worked out. I mean, everybody was was living to get living, you know, in a communal type uh, atmosphere where those who didn't have enough were being cared for. Those who had plenty were were giving out of love. The church was growing. People on the outside were looking in and going, "Whoa, what's going on with these people?" It says fear came upon everybody because they could see the hand of God moving on them. And then the bottom falls out. And Rome and the Sanhedrin start to persecute the church. We have heard the story of Stephen and how that he was out preaching the gospel and he was taken captive by the, the leaders of, of the synagogue. And there he was stoned to death and there was a man named, Peter, or named Paul who stood by and held the coats of those who were killing Stephen. But as Stephen died, he looked into heaven and he says... Father, I can, he says, I can see the Lord sitting at the right hand of the Father. And I'm asking that you don't hold this against them. Forgive them. The love of God being poured out. There was no anger in his voice. There wasn't any of the shaking of the fist at the people who were, who were throwing stones at him. It was, a, it was a, an attitude of, of love and, and mercy that was coming forth from Stephen. See, we as Christians are not called to, to destroy mankind's wickedness. We are not called to overthrow governments. We are not called to destroy nations. We are called <coughs> to spread the gospel. So when the bottom fell out, the people turned to God. God worked a miracle and set Peter free. Here, in 1 Kings, the bottom fell out. The creek, the, the, the creek dried up. The birds quit bringing food. God says to Elijah in verse 8, Get up and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and stay there. I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he, again, was obedient to the Lord. See, being obedient to the Lord is the key to all of this. I, if, I could, if I could title... This whole message, it is obey God. See, when I'm praying for things that I want in this world, I'm not being obedient to God. When I'm wanting this stuff, I'm wanting this world to be like I want it to be, and I want, I want everything in the world to be you know, the way you know, it satisfies me, I am not being obedient to God. But he it says he got up and went to Zarephath, and he came to the town's entrance, and a widow was gathering wood there. And he goes, oh, wow. This is, this, is the, this is the one, you know. And, and when I approach her, she's going to go, oh yeah, I've heard about you. God told me to take care of you. you know, come on in. That's what we, the way we think God works a lot of times, isn't it? But he says, as he came to the town, a widow was gathering wood and he called her and he says, please bring me a drink of water. And as she was going to get it, he called to her again. Now remember, this is a famine. There hasn't been any rain. He's saying, get me a drink of water. That's first of all, that took uh, a little bit of faith. He says, uh, and, and please bring me a piece of bread too. And so, you know, you would think that because God said, I've told this woman, I've, I've got a woman out there that's going to take care of you, that she's going, oh, sure, sure, I've already prepared it. It's waiting on you. No, she said, I solemnly swear as the Lord your God lives, I didn't make, uh, bake any bread. And I have only one handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug and I'm gathering wood and I'm going to prepare something for myself and my son so that we can eat and then we're going to die because that's all we got. In other words, Elijah, uh, I'm sorry, I can't help you. Now God just told him to go down there because he had told this woman to take care of it. And sometimes when we're when God tells us to go do something and we have in our mind what's going to happen when we do that doesn't always happen. I can tell you right, you know, from personal experience, there's some things that God has asked me to do, 
And I've been, and I do them, and I continue to do them. But what I had in mind that was going to take place isn't happening. It's not working the way I thought it was going to work. See, because God's ways are not my ways, and God's thoughts are not mine. His ways are greater than mine. His thoughts higher than mine. And unless He tells me exactly what, what He's going to do and, and how it's going to end up, I have no idea. My only job and your only job is when God speaks to you, obey. He doesn't say, now if you do what, I, what I'm asking you to do, I'm going to make everything work out good for you. Don't worry about it. Yeah, you're, you're, you're going to be fine. And, and you, you, know, you know your deepest desires, those thoughts and those, those uh, ideas that you have? Sure, we'll have that happen. No, he doesn't. He just says, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to do this to take care of you. And so he sent Elijah to this woman, and she goes, I don't have anything for you. In fact, I'm, I'm preparing to just make something here and die. But Elijah, rather than going, God, what did you do? Why did you send me here? I thought you told me this. And said, Elijah, being the man of faith that he was, said to her, don't be afraid. See, he knew that God is faithful to his word. Even when it looks like God is not faithful to his word, God is faithful to his word. Even when things seem to be falling apart all around you, God is faithful to his word. He says, don't be afraid. Just you go on home. And do whatever you said you were going to do. Go ahead and do what you said. But before you sit down and eat your, eat your bread and die, I just want you to make a small cake for me. In other words, he is putting now the woman's faith in God to the test. He says, this is what the Lord God says. Until the Lord sends rain on the land, your jar of flour will never be empty and your jug of oil will never run dry. When we as Christians are so convinced that God is working on our behalf, that God's will is better than our will, that God's ways are greater than our ways, that all things do work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are the called according to His purpose, when we are so convinced of that, that we are willing to walk into the fire, into the lion's den, to be taken captive, to suffer through a famine. When we are so convinced that God is faithful to His Word, then we begin to see the great things that God does. But as long as we stump our feet and say, you're not doing it my way, God, God is saying, well, you know, listen, until you're ready to trust me, I can't do anything for you. You have to trust me in this. Do you trust the Lord in whatever circumstance you're in right now? Are you trusting God that He is going to work things out? Are you, are you trusting Him enough to obey His Word? See, Jesus said, those who are my disciples do those things that I've said. And He says, if you want to be my friend, then you need to hear my words and obey me. Do you trust God enough just to be obedient? Well, what do you mean by that, Pastor? What do you mean? Be obedient? Sure. I, 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 I love the Lord. I, I, I go to church. I read my Bible. Is that what he has told us to do? God says, I am telling you to go and preach the gospel to all nations. He's not, he didn't say, I, I just want you to sit at home and wait on me. See, that's what Elijah was doing up there by the, by the river Cherith. He was just sitting up there waiting on God to do things. And then God says, well, and I, here I have something else I want you to do. I want you to go down here to this woman. So as, as, he, as this woman was obedient to what God was directing, she and her son and Elijah were fed throughout all of the time of the drought. And just as things seem to be just working perfectly, you know, she's at home, her neighbors are struggling, but she's got Elijah living in her, in her house. Elijah's being fed, she's being fed, her son's being fed. It's a miracle every day she wakes up and there's just enough flour for that day, just enough oil for that day. Everything is working out great. And uh, in verse 17 of chapter 17 of 1 Kings, it says, when all of, after all of this happened, the son of the woman who owned the house got sick and he got so sick that he finally died. What? 
You mean, God, you kept him alive through all of this famine, and through the lack of food, and, and through all these problems. I was faithful to you, God. I did exactly what you wanted me to do, God. And my son is now dead. What's going on? See, when we think, we think that, hey, it's, it's smooth riding from here out. We soon find out that it is not smooth riding from here out. That every day we are called upon, every day we are called upon to hearken to the voice of the Lord. Every day when we wake up, we should try to find out, what is it today, God, that you want me to do to serve you? Today, I, I know yesterday was great, and, and you blessed me yesterday, and I praise God, I'm thankful for that. But today, Lord, where are, you, where are you taking me? What are you wanting me to do today? I'm willing to do today what you asked me to do. See, Elijah and the widow and their son, they were living in yesterday. Yes, oh, man, yesterday we had plenty to eat. The day before that we had plenty to eat. Now today the son is dead. And so the woman runs to Elijah and she goes, what are you doing? You brought us through all that just so you could kill my son? But Elijah knew, again, that God is faithful. And so we have the story here of Elijah right raising her son from the dead. All of these things were tests in Elijah's life. Showing him that he could trust God in every situation, even to the point of raising a dead person. That God would take care of him in the, in the middle of troubles. And even when tragedy struck, that God was still God over the tragedy. So in the next chapter, and we're not going to get into that today, but in the next chapter, God says to Elijah, I want you to go and confront Ahab. And that's where we read the story of Elijah confronting the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. And God proving to all of Israel that He is God and that Baal and, Sh and Molech are not gods. That He alone is God. But it took a man who had, had stuck with God and trusted God through the times when things just didn't seem to be working out it took a man who was going to walk with God in all things to come to that place where he was able to trust God to stand on Mount Carmel and face 400 prophets of Baal and face the wrath of, of Jezebel and, and ask God for the miraculous act of burning up the offering that had been placed on an altar and drenched with water before the entire nation. See, we want God to do great things, but we're not really trusting Him in the small trials and the small tests that we go through. The first church, you know, the church of Jerusalem, they were growing and happy and everything was going well, and then persecution came. And the Bible says that, they, they then dispersed. Why do you think God allowed persecution in Jerusalem? And this church that was just living. So, I mean, they were living out the ideal life of a Christian. Why would God allow such persecution to come upon them? And the reason is very obvious to us who are now living in this world today. Because of that persecution, the Christians scattered. And because of their scattering, the church went through the entire world. It was the persecution of the church of Jerusalem that started the churches in Ephesus and Thyatira and Sardis. Started the churches in Europe and in the, in the Asian nations. Started the churches in the United States and South America. It was because of the hardship that the Christians were put into that the gospel of Christ was taken out into all the world. See, God's plan all along was that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance through Christ. He said, how will people do that if they don't hear? And how will they hear unless someone tell them? And how will anybody go out and tell them unless they are sent? So God sent them out, and He used the persecution of the church in Jerusalem to send them. What is God doing in our lives today? What is He doing today to, to 
fulfill His plan for the church in this world, in this time period. He's letting the church and He's letting people who call themselves Christians face some obstacles that will cause us to seek the Lord, to turn to Him and say, God, what do you want me to do? Show me, Lord God. Tell me clearly what my path should be so that I can walk it and be faithful unto Him and not give up and, not, and to quit whining about everything that's not going our way. God never said anywhere in all of Scripture, God never said it's going to go your way. I don't understand how we think that we have the right to ask that of God. He never told us it was going to happen. We have gotten involved in, and I'm going to say this very clearly, we have gotten involved in false teachings and false prophecies that tell us that everything's going to go our way and we're going to have whatever we want. All we have to do is have enough faith. But that's not what the Scripture says. Jesus said, in this world you're going to have troubles. The world's going to hate you because it hates me, He says. He says, you're going to suffer persecutions. He even says that, you know, your own children are going to turn against you and kids, your, your parents are going to turn against you and some of them will, will turn you in to be killed. Now, am I going to believe what Jesus said? Am I going to know that God is faithful to His Word even when His Word hurts a little? Or am I just going to push that aside and say, I want it my way, Lord? James says, Whoever wants to be a friend of this world is an enemy of God. He says, do you think that this passage means nothing? And then he, he says, he quotes a passage, he says this, the spirit that lives in us wants us to be his own. The, the spirit of Christ that is in you, he wants you to be one with him. He wants you to, to just take upon him, upon yourself, his ownership. He wants us to be children of God, not children of this world. Do you think that the Scriptures, the passage doesn't mean anything when it says the Spirit that God gave you, gave you, He wants you to be His? He wants us to look at things in a, a godly, through godly eyes, to do the things that God wants us to do. He wants us to search for and seek for the things that promote the kingdom of God. He wants us to be obedient like Elijah, obedient like the widow, obedient like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Joseph, obedient like the apostles. God shows us even more kindness when He says, God opposes arrogant people, but He is kind to humble people. What's it mean? Those people who are standing up and saying, it's going to be my way or else. He says, God opposes them. God opposes them. I hope that you're not one of them who's declaring, it's going to be my way. This is what I want. But the humble... God will be kind to. Verse 7. So place yourselves under God's authority. What's that mean? Well, that means we, we just we go back to God and say, Lord, I don't understand. I really don't understand, Lord. I don't understand, Lord, but I know that you are faithful to your word. I know that you are faithful to your people. I know that, you, that your word is true and every man is a liar. Lord, I know that, that what you say is yea and amen through Christ. And Lord, I'm just going to hold on to you. If everything else falls apart around me, Lord, I'm going to hold on to you. If the drought happens and everybody around me is suffering with hunger and thirst, I'm going to hold on to you. If the river dries up, I'm still going to hold on to you. If I have to face the lion den, I'll hold on to you, Lord. If I, if I have to go through the fire, God, I'm going to hold on to you. If nobody wants to listen to me when I share the gospel, I'm still going to hold on to you, Lord. That's what it means to submit yourselves, place ourselves under God's authority. God, I am here. I am here for your pleasure. Your word says that you created us for your pleasure. And I am here for your pleasure, so God, I'm just going to hold on to you. When Jesus asked his disciples after the crowds abandoned him one day, he turned to his, his apostles and he said, are you also going to desert me? You're going to go away? And Peter stood up and he said, where are we going to go? You're the one that has the, the words of salvation. Why, where are we going to go, Lord? We're going to hold on to you, Lord. 
What are you saying today to, the, to God? Are you saying, God, I want it my way? Or are we going to say, God, I want, just want to hold on to you? God, I am so, so consumed with, with the world and, and the things that are in the world, whatever they might be. Or are we going to say, God, I know that all that is in the world, even the very elements are going to vanish away with a fervent heat. And all that's going to be left is you and your kingdom. And I'm going to hold on to you. He says, so put yourself under God's authority and resist the devil. What does he mean, resist the devil? And resist simply means like this. No, you're not going to put these crazy thoughts, you're not going to put these falsehoods into my mind, into my spirit. I'm going to trust God. He says, resist the devil. When you're submitted to God and you're resisting the devil, he'll have to flee because he can't get a foothold in your life. So he says, come close to God. And He, God, will come close to you. Now, what do we do? We want to get close to God. What do we have to do? Here's where obedience comes in. He says, clean up your lives, you sinners. Clear your minds, you doubters. If you don't believe that God is faithful to His Word, if you don't believe that God is going to do what God said, if you don't believe that the negative things in the Bible are just as much as God's Word as the positive things, we always like to read the positive things. But everything in the Bible, every scripture is profitable for doctrine, for correction, for instruction. Everything. He says, clean up your lives, you sinners. Clear your minds, you doubters. Be miserable, mourn, and cry. And turn your laughter into mourning and your joy into gloom. Why does he say that? That seems so, so counter-Christian, doesn't it? That is so anti-Christian. We're supposed to rejoice in everything and, and be excited and laugh. And He's not talking about us going through trials and tribulations. He's talking about us looking into our own hearts and seeing there the need to repent. Seeing there how we have failed. Seeing there how we have allowed worldliness and fleshiness to enter in and take charge of our thinking. He says, examine yourself. And turn off this false joy so that God can come in. Humble yourself in the Lord's presence and then He will give you high position or He will exalt you in due time. So here's the, 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 the story. The whole message is this. If I believe God to be true, I'm going to be obedient to Him. If I believe God to be true, I don't have to have all this worldly stuff and, and, and I need to turn to God and allow His will to be done. It's just a, a couple verses here just for you to ponder. If you go to the book of 1 Samuel, and Samuel here speak, uh, speaking, he says, when the day comes, and this is when all of the... All of the Israel, all of Israel wanted a king. And God says, I don't want them to have a king. I want to be their leader. And, and But Samuel, he says, but Samuel, I'm going to tell you what. You go to them. You give them the king they want. But he says this. When that day comes, you will cry out because of the king whom you have chosen for yourselves. Democracy is a wonderful thing, isn't it? We choose our own leaders. He says, when that day comes, you're going to cry out because of the king whom you have chosen for yourselves. And then here comes the kicker. The Lord will not answer you when that day comes. You wonder why we keep struggling? God says, hey, when you run into these kind of problems, I'm not going to, I'm not going to answer you. And the psalmist writes in, in Psalm 66, verse 18, even if I hold evil thoughts, God does not hear my prayers. How many times have we prayed and we prayed for wicked things to happen? Maybe it's because we think that the people we're praying about are wicked people. 
He says, if I even hold that wickedness in my heart, I will not. Or God will not hear us. Isaiah 59. But your sins, your wrongdoings have separated you from your God. Listen, people, we are such a pleasure-seeking society. He says, your wrongdoings, your sins have separated you from your God. Your sins have made Him hide His face so that He does not hear your prayers. We wonder why we pray and pray and pray and things are not changed. Because God has stated that He has a, he has a, a plan he has a purpose. And His purpose is for the salvation. For God so loved the entirety of the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And when we start to pray things that are just self-serving, self-centered, God says, or if we are not willing to repent of our sins and just live in, in our own lustfulness, debauchery, self-will, and we pray, God says, I'm not going to hear that. I'm not going to listen. He says, because to obey is better than sacrifice. People go, well, I go to church all the time. I tithe. God says, to obey is better than sacrifice. Well, you know, I, I, uh, I teach a Sunday school class and I, and I sing in the choir and I, and I stand in the pulpit and preach, God, and preach sermons. And God says, but to obey is better than sacrifice. God is looking for us to obey His Word. And I don't care how many preachers out there tell you that you can tell God what, he, what, what to do. And all you have to do is quote a scripture out of context. And you don't have to do it. They're lying to you. They are liars. I don't care how many so-called prophets will tell you that everything's going to work out the way you want it to and there's no need for you to have to go do anything to repent or to get off of your tails and go out and tell people about Jesus Christ. I don't care how many people tell you that. They are liars. They're false prophets. Because the will of God is clearly stated in His Word. And if you're too lazy to pick up the word and read it, you deserve everything you get. God loves you. And every time we think that we're going through a hardship, every time that we think things are going wrong, it's because God is trying to draw us closer to Himself. He is trying to show us that we have to rely upon Him, that He is the source of all of our blessings, that He is the source of of everything good, that every good and perfect gift comes from above and not from this world. When everything around us is falling apart, it is simply because God is saying, come on, trust me, trust me. Obey my word and trust me. And I will open the windows of heaven, pour out blessings upon you so much that you won't even be able to contain them all. God loves you. And because God loves you, He brings about messages that sometimes stomp on your toes. Open your hearts to the Word of God. Let the Holy Spirit teach you. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit will teach you all things. He will remind you of those things which you were taught. He will lead you into all truth. Let the Holy Spirit do His job in your life. Father, we have come into your house and gathered in your name to worship you. We have come here today, O oh Lord God, seeking your face and wanting to hear your word. Lord God, help. We need your help. Because we have become so accustomed to thinking that we were always right and that we're always on your side. But all we're doing is seeking our own will. God, help us. Forgive us. Cleanse us. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. And renew a right spirit within me.
cast me not away from your presence, O oh God. And don't take your Holy Spirit from me. But renew a right spirit within me. God help us. Let us pray this song together as we close. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away. Cast me not away from your presence, O Lord. Remove not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and renew a right spirit within me. Oh God, please renew a right spirit within us, we pray. Thank you for your grace, for your patience, for your mercy.